formed uh, here with us. Our next session uh, will be uh, focused on uh, preventing gang and youth violence. We began this discussion during our LA leadership meeting where we focused on gang violence prevention programs like our Summer Night Lights initiative. In fact, uh, some 50 mayors uh, visited one of our parks, uh, if you recall. And uh, now there are cities across the country that are working on the same uh, gang violence reduction uh, strategies. This last fall, our Vice President, uh, Mayor Michael Nutter of Philadelphia, convened an important discussion regarding violence targeting African-American males. And just two weeks ago, when he was inaugurated for his second term, uh, Mayor Nutter pledged to work with mayors around the country to deal with the proliferation of illegal guns. I don't have to tell you that Mayor Michael uh, Bloomberg and Mayor Menino have been focused on this issue, has, has, as have so many of the rest of us. Now, Mayor Nutter and I have been working closely together on these priorities, and I'm very pleased uh, to have this discussion today. Uh, moderating our panel will be Patrick McCarthy, who last spring uh, became the president and CEO of the Annie E. Casey Foundation, an organization which the Conference of, of Mayors has a very strong partnership with. When he was the foundation's senior vice president, uh, Patrick oversaw its work in a number of areas, including juvenile justice, youth development, and the mental health initiative for urban children. On our panel, along with Mayor Nutter, is uh, New Orleans Mayor Mitch Landrieu, uh, both Mayor Nutter and Mayor Landrieu have made reducing violence a top priority for their administrations. And also on our panel is Kathy Lanier, the highly respected chief of police for the District of Columbia. And you heard those numbers uh, yesterday. Um, I think the uh, recollection is the homicide rate is down to 1963 levels. Uh, amazing. Uh, this is the police chief, everybody. And and the cornerstone of, a cornerstone of Chief Lanier's leadership has been her commitment to reducing violent crimes by fostering strong partnerships with both the community and the criminal justice system, resulting in a significant de decrease in the number of homicides, which as I said a few minutes ago. And of course, uh, many of you remember him uh, from our last meeting in Los Angeles. Uh, we're joined by Guillermo Céspedes my deputy mayor and director of gang reduction and youth development. Guillermo has over 25 years of experience in the design, implementation, and supervis supervision of the delivery of services to disadvantaged and at-risk youth. He is, without question, uh, the architect of the Summer Night Lights program. Uh, let me now turn over the panel uh, to Patrick McCarthy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we're looking forward to a very lively discussion here. You know, the Casey Foundation does research and data analysis across all sorts of issues that affect kids. After 25 years of research, there, there are three things that just stand out as if a child experiences them, they're more likely to grow up with lousy outcomes, including becoming involved with gangs and with youth violence. Number one is poverty, a child that doesn't have a sense of hope and opportunity. Number two, a child who's not connected in a strong way to a family that has the resources to take care of them. And number three, a child who's growing up in a community where the, uh, there's a concentration of disadvantage, where it's not safe, where the schools are bad, et cetera. So the, the foundation has done a lot of work over the years in each of these uh, three areas. Uh, we've done a lot of work to try to uh, help build a path towards opportunity for parents and to put kids on a path towards success through educational uh, in investments. We do a lot of work around uh, improving the strength of families to support kids. Obviously, lots of kids grow up poor and they do just fine. 
Usually that's because they're connected to a family that is strong. And finally, and I think most relevant for our conversation today, we do a lot of work in the area of community development because we know that if a community is a good place to raise kids, it's a place where it's safe, where there are good schools, there's quality housing, parks, recreation, and that community is connected to employment and opportunity. So today's panel deals with some of the most challenging areas that any city faces. How do we protect families? How do we protect our youth from violence and from the kind of social disruption that goes along with gangs and youth violence? Thanks to all the panel members for being here today. We're going to start with just asking each panel member to make a, a few brief comments, and then there are going to be some specific questions that we'll dive on into, and we'll go uh, from my left over and starting with Mayor Nutter. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Patrick, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, just by way of uh, context, Philadelphia, fifth largest city in America, a million and a half people, about 6,400 uh, police officers, uh, which is uh, actually fewer officers uh, than when I was uh, sworn in the first time uh, four years ago. Uh, we have had some reduction in crime, but we've had some challenges, uh, and I'll talk about those uh, in a second. Um, Part of the reason why, and I thank our president, uh, Villaraigosa, for agreeing to have this panel, uh, is to have uh, more of a frank conversation about what's going on uh, in uh, many of our cities and certainly urban America. A little context. Uh, last, in 2010, uh, there were a little more than 13,000 murder victims uh, in the United States of America. African Americans account for 50 percent of the total homicide victims, and 85 percent of those victims were uh, African-American men. On average each day, 16 young people between the ages of 10 and 24 are murdered. 86 percent of them are males. Of the offenders caught committing these murders, 16 percent are black men under the age of 24. Earlier this week, uh, of course, uh, we celebrated Martin Luther King's uh, birthday, his life, and legacy. 85,000 Philadelphians came out uh, on a day of service, the largest uh, Martin Luther King Day service uh, a celebration uh, in the country. And of course, his legacy was one of service, personal responsibility, and hope. We're watching, unfortunately, an entire generation of African American men continue to fall behind. This next generation of children grow up in many instances without fathers, without uncles, without any uh, positive male role model in their lives. And we're watching many communities, unfortunately, crumble under the weight of incarceration, drugs, illiteracy and most of all, violence. We, the question is, while we're watching, what are we doing? I want to call on all of our mayors uh, to stand uh, as an organization, as a group, uh, to confront this violence uh, and not put up with it any longer. And this is a call to action, and we need a national discussion uh, to start uh, moving toward having a direct impact on this violence as it affects our communities and our families. A couple of actions uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, not last year, I reestablished uh, what had been created uh, 20 years ago by uh, my predecessor, Mayor Good, the Mayor's Commission on African American Males, uh, to comprehensively address uh, the issues facing uh, African American men, and not only with regard to crime and public safety issues, but also job training, health care services, education, and employment opportunities. The Commission has two major goals, addressing comprehensively the issues surrounding uh, this community and to provide strategic programming and opportunities uh, for African-American men in Philadelphia. As Mayor Villaraigosa also mentioned, last October I hosted uh, an event uh, in Philadelphia called Cities United at the National Constitution Center. Our good friend Mayor Mitch uh, was there and a, a number of other mayors. During that conference, uh, we understood that government, nonprofits, businesses, schools, community leaders, and stakeholders all need to work together if we are to help black men and boys excel and thrive in the 21st century. This crisis is not just a law enforcement issue. This is a community-based issue. And we must include education as a top priority as a component of our public safety strategy in our cities. And when we look at graduation rates, we also see uh, differences between and among the various races and ethnic groups. Four-year cohort high school graduation rate in Philadelphia is 58 percent. White and Asian males exceed this rate, 62 percent for whites, 76 percent for Asian males. And black and Latino males fall below the average, 51 percent for African American males, 42 percent for Hispanic or Latino males. And while looking at college graduation and education, only one in ten Philadelphia high school freshmen will actually graduate 
from a four-year college. Of course, some of those key factors with regard to the dropout rate are failing math, failing English, less than an 80 percent attendance rate, and poor behavior. In Philadelphia in 2011, we had 316 homicides in our city. That's still down from when I first came into office. 82 percent were killed with a firearm. 85 percent of the victims were African American. 94 percent of the African Americans killed by firearms were males. Year to date, we have 21 murders in Philadelphia. We were off to a terrible start uh, this year, including last week, a uh, 30-year-old man shot up a uh, vehicle with seven teenagers in that vehicle, killing three, and one was shot in the neck. This was after uh, a series of disputes among teenagers over Facebook that have been going on since last summer, uh, with culminated with these seven young people being out at 10.30 at night, uh, showing up at the home of one of the individuals that they were arguing with, uh, and this uh, a man who was a stepfather of the other kid uh, caught them in the alley, in the vehicle, not armed, never gotten out, and, and shot up the car. We know the risk factors. We know the stats. And what we need to do, of course, is take action and take it head on. And so I look forward to an engaged conversation. Uh, we must be able to have these kinds of discussions without fear of retribution from uh, particular constituencies or fear of crit off, uh, felt criticism uh, that we're only blaming the victims. This is about behavior. This is about bad decision making. Uh, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mayor Nutter and Mayor Lando. Thank you, um, Mayor Mike, for those uh, courageous comments. You know, all over America, if you look at the numbers, uh, some cities are better than others, uh, but everybody's got the problem. New Orleans, in some instances, has it worse than others, uh, but it's not happening really well anywhere. When you look at the numbers uh, on the issue of murder, uh, which is obviously a, a subset of the overarching issue of violence, uh, I like to say a lot of times that if, if you're not safe, you can't be free. Uh, everybody knows what happens to a community, to a family, to a neighborhood, to an economy when people begin to feel unsafe, and that is an overarching issue. But the specific one that both Mayor Nutter and I uh, have begun to speak more clearly about and more forcefully about uh, are the number of deaths that are taking place on the American streets that are occurring between young African-American men for seemingly no reason at all. Now, I'll give you some statistics in New Orleans. With 343,000 people, uh, we have between 1,200 and 1,300 uh, police officers. We have a school system that we're reorganizing. We're working both on the front end and on the back end of this. So we've doubled the funding for the Recreation Department uh, to try to stop the kids from getting to where they don't need to be. Uh, we're working on innovative measures in our schools. We're doing everything that we think everybody else in the country is doing. We're borrowing from the Milwaukee Homicide Review Commission that we call uh, the Mayor's Strategic Command. We're working on some initiatives that St. Louis put in place. I had a great conversation with the chief here about some of the wonderful work that she's doing. But let me, let me sear these uh, statistics uh, into your mind. Uh, we had 199 murders in New Orleans last year. That's 14 percent above the year before. From 1990 uh, through today, we have always had 7 to 10 percent higher than the national average. But if you look around the country, what you're going to find is in about 73 cities, uh, you've got a higher murder rate than other places. And in those cities, it's in four, five, six, seven neighborhoods that follow very closely along uh, the lines that he was talking about, where you find poverty, family breakdown, uh, and not great pathways to prosperity, either in early childhood education, primary and secondary schools, uh, or Votex schools. In New Orleans, uh, the victim information, 86.5 of the victims are male. 91.5% of the victims of African American. Over half of the victims are under the age of 28. Criminal history, 6.65% uh, have a prior felony. 33 have a prior arrest for illegal firearm possession. 55% uh, are unemployed. That's victim. Let's talk about the perpetrators for a minute. 95 percent of the perpetrators are male, 97 percent of the perpetrators are African American, over the half of the perpetrators are under 23. Criminal history, 83 uh, percent of the perpetrators have a prior felony, 40 percent have had a prior arrest for illegal firearm possession, uh, over 55 percent are unemployed, 88 percent of them knew each other. Now, that is a startling 
uh, number or level of statistics. It's unconscionable. It's unacceptable. It doesn't have to be that way. It can change. Uh, but we are seeing uh, an alarming spike of uh, the boldness of these activities. In New Orleans, uh, a couple of weeks ago, two guys got in a fight uh, around where they live. They shot each other uh, or shot at each other, and the bullet uh, happened to find the head of a two-year-old child um, who, was, who was killed. Uh, not long before that, there was a young boy named Jeremy Gowman who was uh, not much older than that that was in the arms of his grandmother, and he got caught in the middle of gunfire. And when we talk about the consequence of that kind of behavior uh, on cities and on communities and on families, uh, the devastation is almost entire and hard to comprehend. So uh, I want to congratulate and thank Mayor Nutter for taking this issue on and for the Conference of Mayors for addressing it. I think we have to speak directly to it. I don't think that we can be afraid of it. There are examples, and I think the chief is going to tell us uh, some that she is using where we're seeing great successes around the country. We have to find them. We have to mirror them. And then the federal, state, and local governments, along with the private sector, not-for-profits, have to work together to focus uh, very, very quickly uh, on this issue. And I look forward to uh, further comments during the panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to give you just a little perspective on uh, Washington also. I've been with MPD, uh, the Metropolitan Police Department, for 21 years. My first year on the job, we had 479 murders in the city. Uh, our population was about 10 percent less then than it is now. Um, our homicide closure rate at the time was uh, in the low 40 percent. Most of my career, Washington, D.C., has been known as two things, the homicide capital of the world and the city of unsolved murders. There are literally thousands of unsolved cold cases and murders in the city. Um, what I'm going to talk about is, you know, I, I don't have a magic bullet. In, in the three to five minute opening, I can only give you um, one aspect of what we've done here, but it's the one aspect that should make everybody think about whatever it is that you are doing, because we tend to um, look at successful models and then emulate those models. And New York City being one of the most famous, um, look, looking at how New York was um, so successful in reducing violent crime, um, two of the most popular policing <coughs> methods around the country were hot spots policing, you know, create a density map of where most of your murders are, and for all of us it's the same, just a handful of neighborhoods, and then flood those neighborhoods with police and do zero tolerance. Um, even the smallest of violations um, that is chargeable results in arrest. Well, this is supported by Kelling and Wilson, who did the broken windows theory many, many years ago, so it makes sense. But I can tell you that successful policing models don't come in a one-size-fits-all, and what is very successful in one place can be have completely the opposite impact somewhere else. And I'm going to give you that example uh, in, in my opening comments. Um, so hotspots and zero tolerance policing in Washington, D.C. had the opposite effect for us. East of the river, the two police districts, 6th and 7th District, historically, um, as long as I've been on, has accounted for at least 60 percent of all the murders in the city, two small patrol districts. Um, some of those neighborhoods were notorious. So we had always done the same thing, and for the past 15 years, we flood the neighborhood with a lot of cops, zero tolerance. If you're out drinking a beer on your front stoop, you've got an open container of alcohol, you're going to jail. The problem for us is, is that uh, does two things. One is what you forget is most of your victims also come from that same neighborhood. <laughs> Secondly, the people that have the information about who's doing the shooting, they also live in that neighborhood. So when you're doing the zero tolerance policing, who are you picking up and who are you alienating? Your residents, your victims, and your witnesses. So now they have no respect for the police. They have no reason to speak to the police. Uh, the other problem that I had that I think every police department has or has had at some time, um, okay, so nobody likes the police because we go into these high crime neighborhoods and we lock them down and we lock everybody up. So they don't like us, they don't trust us, they don't want to talk to us. But even inside the organization, the people that have information that help, would help us prevent and solve crimes won't talk to each other because inside a police organization, knowledge is power. And narcotics detectives that have sources that can help close homicides is not going to call a homicide detective and share his source. <laughs> everybody knows that. Patrol officers who really know the most about everybody in the neighborhood and where their girlfriend lives and where their grandmother lives and what car they drive 
have a wealth of information, but there's no homicide detective that's going to go talk to a uniformed patrol officer and get that information because clearly the homicide detective is superior. So that was my second problem. <laughs> the third problem was I have great technology and great analytical staff, but I couldn't get the people in all the various different units that had the bits and pieces of information to share it with the guy that could analyze it and use the technology to give us the ability to predict violence and stop it. So that was the second challenge. The, the third big challenge really is a culture of policing nationwide. And I hear police leaders say it, I hear managers say it, and I hear officers say it. We can't stop homicides. That's crap. We can and we do. And until you change that culture, you're not going to implement any kind of effective policing to, to reduce homicides. So now the solution. I don't know if we have my slides. That first slide that's up there, that is kind of the analysis of the problem. And as you can see, guns, gangs, and drugs is at the heart of all of our problems. Um, if you're not a gang member or a drug user or toting a gun, you're probably not going to get murdered in most cities. Um, so the solution is the outside ring, which is, as you see, the orange and the yellow gathering intelligence and information and community partnerships and connections. We couldn't get either one of those. I've already explained that because we've alienated those folks. We couldn't do anything on the outside to solve the problems on the inside. So our solution really was to do the opposite. So I did, in fact, um, use hotspots. I looked at the areas in, in my neighborhoods where the most violence was concentrated east of the river. I did, in fact, dump a ton of resources, in fact, all my resources into those two neighborhoods. But I had to change the mentality. First of all, if I tell my cops to go out and do, do community policing, you know, there's all kinds of reasons why that's just not a good strategy. First of all, it's, it's not cop-like. Secondly, nobody really knows what community policing is by definition. So I told them I needed to go out and develop sources. And I started with patrol cops because typically developing sources is for narcotics. And how do they develop sources? They lock people up or threaten to lock them up <laughs> and get them to cooperate. But I wanted a, a different mentality. I took foot patrol officers, 300 of them put them out in the highest crime neighborhoods and told them, I need you to develop sources. And how do you go about developing sources? You get to know everybody in the neighborhood. You treat them with respect. Everybody you come across as sir or ma'am. And, you know, do the exact opposite of zero tolerance. I gave those officers handheld devices, Blackberries. They have access to their email. They have a cell phone number. I pay for your phone. You're going to give the number out. They give their cell phone number to the old lady sitting on her porch drinking her beer at 9 o'clock in the morning instead of making her dump her beer, um, and get to know people in neighborhoods. That was the first step. I can tell you, a big anonymous police force is never going to get information. People have to know somebody by name that they can call, that they trust to give information, and that was the first step. The second step is, is that some people aren't going to trust us anyway. You have to have means of getting information that everybody in the criminal justice system is opposed to. So I wanted to start an anonymous text tip line. Everybody in homicide said, oh, no, chief, don't do that. You're going to ruin it. We can't use anonymous sources. And then we'll have to just run down all these crazy leads. And the United States Attorney's Office says, you know, we've been working on this stop snitching campaign for all these years. You're just going to undo that. So everybody, the sky was falling. Don't do it. All right. Well, we did it anyway. We created an anonymous text tip line primarily because the people with the information to prevent some of the violence are the young people. And young people don't talk on telephones. They're not going to walk up to a cop and tell them something. But if you give them a text number, ours is 50411, while you're here in my city, uh, if you need that. Uh, 50411, our tagline was give the, give the 50 the 411. We started out in the schools. And the information started to come in at an unbelievable rate. And I'm telling you, the detail information that we get on those text tips that have helped us interdict guns, to take shooters off the street, to anticipate gang violence has been unbelievable. We've expanded it, and I'll show you some stats. Actually, if you can go to the next slide. You know, I can't show you statistically what we prevent, and that's frustrating for a police officer, but I can show you in these numbers what we prevented and how we prevented them. I'm sure we're looking at the right slide here. So if you look at um, the top graph, actually, my eyes aren't that good, sorry. I've got a little tiny screen up here. All right, so if you look at the top graph, this is our text tip line. I implemented it in 2008. We got 292 text tips in. By the end of 2011, we were over 1,200. That's a 300% increase. And I can tell you the type of tips we get in is just 
simply unbelievable. As soon as a shooting happens or um, if there's a, a beef that wells up in the schools, if my school resource officers don't already have it, we're getting names, addresses, descriptions on cars, everything before the violence even starts. So that's an important part of it. The other thing, a graph I can show that helps support that we've actually established those good relationships and people do trust us now. On the bottom graph, that's our reward payouts. We have always had um, $25,000 reward for arrest that leads to, or information that leads to arrest and conviction. So that's not an anonymous tip. That's somebody who's willing to come forward and be prepared to testify. And, and we could never get that in Washington, D.C. Nobody, and you'd have a broad daylight shooting with 30 witnesses, nobody was going to be given information to police, much less testifying. We give out, if you look at our increase in text, in our um, reward money, in 2006 and 2007, we were around $200,000 a year. Starting in 2008, we jumped up to $400,000 a year and have remained above $400,000 a year since. As a result of that, if we can go to the next slide. First of all, in the last three years, our murders have been reduced by 42%. Last year alone, east of the river, we reduced murders 56% in one year. And that is in the, in the area of the city that has traditionally had 60 plus percent of all of our murders, because that's where we built those relationships and focused our efforts. And if you look at the next slide, our homicide closure rate this year is 95%. National average for cities our size is 56%. And national average for departments of any size is in the low 60%. So if those numbers don't support that we've established connections in our community, people do trust us, and some of those things that are successful other places are not so successful here, nothing else paints a better picture than those numbers. So with that, I'll leave you with just you know, the thought when you talk about youth um, violence and youth homicides and some of the other issues. There's many, many social issues, and I agree with everything that has been said. We had a huge problem with uh, juvenile offenders and juvenile victims. Last year, we reduced the number of um, persons under the age of 18 uh, arrested for murder only by 5 percent, but we reduced the number of victims by 55 percent because there's a lot more that goes along with policing than arresting people. My philosophy has been you need to have less crime, but you should do it with less arrest. And if you have less crime and less arrest, that's the goal, and not measuring everything by statistics on how many lockups you make. So maybe there's some element of that that you can use in your jurisdiction. Maybe there's some new philosophy that fits better for your city. But my opinion has been um, that is one of the most successful things for us in D.C. So I think I think Mayor Landra has a quick question, and then we're going to go to the final. Chief, thank you for that. That was spectacular. Um, I just wanted to ask you, though, um, from the time that you started to implement these new policy to the time that you started seeing meaningful results, how long did it take to put it in place, to ramp it up, and then to see some meaningful uh, and dramatic change? Some things work faster than others. The tip line uh, was instant. Uh, once we got the tip line out, that was instant. We marketed it pretty heavily in, with our young people first, and so that, that went that pretty well. Changing the culture inside the organization has taken me, it, it took a good two years. And, and I tell you, it has to be zero tolerance <laughs> for information sharing to the point where um, right now, we finally got this down. Right now, if there's a shot spotter hit or a gunshot that's fired, I've got a a gang conflict going on right now in the city, and everybody in the department knows it because we share that. But if there's a gang conflict going on right now and I get a gunshot in neighborhood one, and we know neighborhood two and one are in conflict, within five minutes, and I just showed you an example of this, within five minutes of that gunshot being fired, our gang intelligence unit will deploy to both of the neighborhoods where the gangs that are in conflict are and start knocking on doors of the rival gang members and letting them know, hey, we're just checking in. <laughs> this takes away the anonymity, which is the retaliation, and that buys us enough time to go after the offender. So forcing that information sharing took a good two years, and I had to replace about five homicide commanders. <laughs> so I'm going to suggest we move on to Deputy Mayor Spendis, and then we'll... Thank you. Um, in July of 2007, our mayor a, took a very bold step and created the Mayor's Office of Gang Reduction and Youth Development. Um, most of his advisors thought he was committing, um, this wasn't a very wise political thing to do, in a city with over 400 gangs and 41,000 
documented gang members. That does not include the county. That is just the city of L.A. And where 54% of all homicides are gang-related homicides. He not only created this office, but he also um, brought in all of the funding of all of the gang prevention and gang intervention programs that were scattered throughout the city and created, in essence, an infrastructure that is now staffed by 30 full staff members. Um, it's led by a deputy mayor with direct access and accountability to the mayor, a $24 million budget, and very rigorous evaluation measures because 83% of our funding comes from the general fund. The problem has been defined repeatedly in this panel. Um, this year we celebrated the second year in Los Angeles with homicides under 300. Um, 298 homicides is too many. There are things that we're doing that we're very proud of that we think are being very effective and, and I agree with, with Mayor Nutter that there's a lot of work that we still have to do. So I'm going to share with you what my mandate is on behalf of the city, um, which is the comprehensive strategy that we implement to try to address this problem. If we could go to the first slide, please. There are three components of this comprehensive strategy that we find extremely valuable. Number one, that is place-based. We have identified 13 um, what we call gang reduction youth development zones throughout the city, and I'll give you a quick profile of what those zones look like. They're relatively small, 3.5 square miles on an average. 40% of the population are youth under 18. 55% of foster care youth attend schools in those zones. And 31% of youth on probation attend schools on those, in those zones. Roughly 30% of the families live below the poverty line as compared to 19% for the, the rest of LA with a median income of $30,000. These are marginalized communities, forgotten communities, communities that we in the helping profession um, would rather ignore. Um, second component of the comprehensive strategy is that it's family-based. And by family-based, I don't mean that we focused on families to blame them for what has taken place, but we do need to recruit families to become our partners in resolving this issue, the issue of gang violence and the issue of youth who um, are insistent in developing a full-fledged identity as a gang member. Family, in the context of our comprehensive strategy, is minimally three generations. So we're not talking about mom, dad, sort of the, the usual nuclear unit. That means we engage across the city in all of our strategy, minimally three generations of families, and recruit them to help us with this. And then the last element of the comprehensive strategy is that it is empirically driven. Um, the history, I think you've heard all the terms, LA is a gang capital of the world, world, the mothership, the belly of the beast, the city that exported gangs, all of that. Most of the solutions that were applied prior to the mayor setting up the Office of Gang Reduction and Youth Development were really driven by conventional wisdom and um, not necessarily empirical evidence, not necessarily research, but conventional wisdom. What we mean by empirical evidence or empirically driven comprehensive strategy is that not only do we need to re rely on the best research, but gang dynamics change every single day. So we spend a lot of time on the ground figuring out how that fixed data about gang numbers and who is aligned with who changes on a day-to-day -day basis. What does a comprehensive strategy look like? If we could go to the next slide. All right, so it is made up of five prongs and 18 different strategies. And we won't go through each one of the strategies, but I urge you to at least divide this chart into three components. The prevention component, the intervention component, and what we call the law enforcement component. 
Prevention, we separate into the aspects that have to do with building community resiliency because these youth live in communities that are devastated by social conditions. Secondary prevention for us means addressing those youth who are at the highest risk of becoming gang involved. Now, we don't eyeball that anymore. We've had researchers develop a tool and each one of the 10 to 15 year olds that receive services through our comprehensive strategy have been identified to be at the highest risk of becoming gang involved. Most of the research shows that less than 15% of youth in the worst of neighborhoods in LA become fully identified as a gang member. So we have to identify who that 15% is. Our chief of police, probably my closest partner is in this endeavor, um, Charlie Beck maintains that two to 3% of that 15% are the actual shooters. Intervention. So prevention means preventing these kids from becoming gang affiliated, gang identified. Intervention for us refers to the idea of extracting and building an exit ramp for those who are already gang involved. In that aspect, we do use former gang members that have become um, certified, trained, fingerprinted, and hired through the city of LA to actually help us in tandem with law enforcement to engage those members of the community that are most likely to be victims of violence or perpetrators of violence. And of course, the law enforcement component, um, which um, we do use the term community policing. I do spend a lot of time with my partner, Charles Beck, at community meetings, um, dealing with communities after um, major takedowns, after officer-involved shootings, sometimes at basketball games, etc. There are three components of what we do that run across all the five prongs. What we call community and law enforcement engagement, um, those of us who've been in the field for a long time have attempted to do this work separate of law enforcement. It's just not very effective. Um, and I think LA has tried every strategy on the law enforcement end from kicking down doors and um, you know the hard knock approach and all of that, and that was not very effective. So for us, law enforcement is a part of the community. Um, so we develop strategies that cut across all of the prongs that we refer to as community law, enfor law enforcement engagement strategies. The Summer Night Lights program that you folks visited, um, it's gotten a lot of national attention. The value of the program is this. We know in LA that Wednesday through Saturday, 7 p.m. to midnight, from July 4th through Labor Day weekend, youth violence spikes. Um, starting in 2008, although we piloted the program in 2003 and 2004, we started basically developing programmatic strategies that kept every stakeholder in the community at recreational facilities at least until midnight. And when I say every stakeholder, I don't mean, the definition of stakeholder means it includes those who are gang involved or gang affiliated. It is the only time during the year um, in Los Angeles where gang injunctions are not enforced as long as people are participating in the program. Um, Again, it's place-based, particular neighborhoods during the time of the year where crime is likely to spike. Um, and we've been doing that for four years. And then, of course, evaluation. We have to make sure that what we're doing is working, and if it's not working, we need to change courses. Um, fortunately, I have the full support of my boss so that if a strategy is not working, he is not bashful about changing the direction of that strategy. <laughs> Most of the time that I spend with the boss is actually in these neighborhoods. I would say probably 85% of my meeting time with him is walking through these neighborhoods in the middle of the night. I'm gonna give you some rough numbers about our evaluation, what seems to be effective. And again, um, keep in mind that we have a lot of work to do. 
but we have started to collect data that tells us that we're perhaps on the right track. I'll start with the Summer Night Lights program. This past summer, we had 774,000 visits to these sites. We fed 484,000 meals. We provided 1,614 jobs, primarily to youth who would not be employed during the summer. We had a 35% reduction in gang-related part one crime, a 43% reduction in aggravated assaults, and a 55% reduction in shots fired, which we're very excited about. If people shoot less, people get hit less. Those numbers are from July 4th, Labor Day weekend, Wednesday through Saturday, 7 p.m. to midnight. At the intervention level, we do something different than many other cities, which is I have a staff of 30. With the exception of the fiscal team, we're all on call 24-7, 365 days a year. So whenever there is a gang-related incident anywhere in the city, it is not just law enforcement that responds. Um, there's a, what we call a relational triangle that includes law enforcement responds, gang intervention workers respond, and a representative, either me or one of my staff members from the mayor's staff, responds. That is 24-7, 365 days a year. From April 09 to December of 2011, we responded in this format to 2,058 incidents. Now, um, why do we do this? The issue of retaliation, um, we have not yet achieved the point where we can predict a homicide, but we've gotten fairly effective at reducing levels of retaliation. So, and that reduction, that strategy to reduce retaliation starts the minute there's an incident. So Mr. Deputy Mayor, what I'm gonna suggest, given the limited time we have, I was gonna give the uh, panel members an opportunity Great. to ask a question of each other and meanwhile ask the folks in the room here to think about a question or an issue you want to raise. We got started a little bit late, so we're uh, very tight on time, but anyone from the panel want to raise a question with any of the other uh, panel members? Yeah, why don't we just... You want to go right to the... Uh, uh. Okay. That, that's okay. fine by me. So uh, again, as in the last session, if you have a question, please raise your hand. There are uh, microphones that will come to you when you raise your question. Would you please just let us know who you are? So I see a hand here in the middle of the room. Do we have a microphone? I want to make sure we also get um, our um, Mayor Stephanie Rawlings-Blake uh, is the uh, chair of our uh, criminal and social justice uh, committee, and I know she's doing some exciting things uh, in Baltimore as well. I want to make sure that we hear from her. Yes, so, as a, as a Baltimorean, I would be quite remiss in not giving uh, the representative of the city in which the winning team on Saturday comes from. So we'll have this question first, and then we'll turn it over to Mayor Rongs Blake. Thank you. To all the panelists, my name is Linda Thompson. I'm the mayor of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and I want to commend you on your efforts to uh, combat crime and bring it down. Um, Mike Nutter, Mayor Nutter is no stranger to what we're doing in Harrisburg, but to the chief uh, of police, uh, I commend you. you know, it's amazing some of the things you talked about without even knowing what you were doing. I started in 2010. Um, we had homicides at, seven, at 17 homicides in my first year. And we're now down to six. We had our first homicide of this year, and that's because of smart policing. I took the cops uh, out of the cars and put them on the street, and it just went back to how I was raised when I noticed Mr. Friendly walking in neighborhoods, building relationships and giving a sense of um, a trust with the citizens, and they are telling and talking to our police. Uh, we had 100% uh, resolution in our homicides for 2011. Every single homicide that occurred in 2010, we resolved in 2011, and that's because the cops got out there, started going to the bars, building relationships with the citizens, and using those people to have a trust level with them, a, a level of confidence, and uh, we resolved those, those homicides. Also, um, what I've done with uh, getting the guns off the streets, since we're not getting any help from our United States Congress, I'm putting signs all up throughout my city saying that mayor's illegal gun, anonymous tippers, 
So anyone who knows about a nephew, a neighbor, an uncle, or aunt who's carrying an illegal gun, I ask them to call us in, tip us off, and then we'll do the investigation to determine whether they are a legal gun bearer. So if mayors want to, you know, these signs are, are allowing people to call in anonymously and tell us where they know these guns are to help get them off the street. So I just want to commend you in your efforts of smart policing and say that it is working. It depends on your neighborhood, but we're really forceful about it. And I had pushback, too, from the old guard. I'm a first-time woman mayor in the city of Harrisburg, first African-American woman, and police officers are 95% white, and they just had this culture inside, and I just kept pushing and using my authority and got some changing, and now they're on board, and we're really working well. We're also on, uh, involved with pre the intervention as well. We just opened up a, a new PAL center uh, after 40 years of not having it open. Our police officers now are actively engaged with teaching our kids, you know, just how to be involved with school. They're being mentors. Uh, we started a program where we took them out shopping for Christmas. Uh, we raised money and gave the kids $100 to go out and shop, you know, to buy gifts for their parents because these are very impoverished kids who often lead to crime. So these are some of the inter innovative things we're doing to not only get into, involved with the intervention but also the prevention as well. And our district attorney is very much involved with us He's on the PAL board, and so we have a very global uh, effort with community people being involved with uh, trying to get this crime under control. So thank you again for your leadership. Thank, thank you. you very much, Madam Mayor. Uh, Mayor Rawlings Blake. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity. I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, working as, as vice chair. And Patrick, thank you very much for mentioning your, your hometown now, uh, Baltimore. It is, uh, I'm certainly honored to have the Annie e, Annie e. Casey Foundation in Baltimore, and thanks for rooting. Even though I'm scooting out uh, very shortly because I have to cement the bet with Mayor Menino, who in his heart must be a Ravens fan since he came up to the microphone sporting a Ravens purple tie, but that's another story. Uh, everyone saw it. I'm not making it up. Uh, youth violence has been a problem in, in Baltimore for many years, and we've taken a collaborative approach, uh, building on uh, relationships and partnerships, and we've driven uh, juvenile violence down in the last two years alone by 37%. Since 2007, juvenile homicides are down nearly 50%, shootings down nearly uh, 70%, and it is because we, uh, just like Mayor Nutter in, advised me when I first became a mayor, if you see something that works in another city, steal it. Uh, so we have our Safe Streets um, initiative, which is modeled off of uh, ceasefire. Uh, we just, it's been very successful, uh, that, that model that I'm sure uh, people are familiar with. And it is, um, we just announced with help of federal funding an expansion into more neighborhoods. We have the diversion program that has the benefit of federal funding that uh, pulls at-risk kids that, that have the first-time contact with the juvenile justice system for nonviolent offenses. Uh, we're adding funding to that. Those are federal funds. Um, and all of these things uh, are hanging in the balance. So as we work to collaborate on strategies, we also need to work to collaborate on lobbying to make sure that these funds, uh, the um, juvenile justice funds, the, the Burns money, the COPS money, um, aren't, aren't cut. Uh, that when, that uh, as Mayor Smith says, that we make smart cuts um, so we can make sure that we continue to have a safe city. So I'm looking forward to working with all of you. Sorry I have to scoot out to make uh, my bet, and hopefully you all are rooting for the Ravens. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I see a hand towards the back here, center. This microphone over here. I can't get over it. Oh, um, uh, this is Joe Riley from Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, quickly, uh, it's a great panel, and thank you all for so many wonderful ideas. Uh, uh, in uh, following up with some ideas from the uh, chief of police in Washington, something that we do that I think is easily replicable is we have our summer camp uh, in the inner city uh, for our uh, kids, middle school uh, students that their uh, middle school principals recommend would uh, benefit from some additional mentoring and support in the summer, and the police department runs it. Uh, it's on a very modest budget. We call it Camp Hope. Uh, they, uh, from, not, from 5.30 in the afternoon till 9 o'clock, uh, lots of different activities and, and uh, interesting and fun things for the kids uh, when they get their diploma at the end of the summer, they give the police officer a big hug, but the families and the community members are aware of what's going on. So 
we get uh, far more uh, co co cooperation from the neighborhoods now when crimes occur, and the relationship with our police department, which was good, is even better, and it's a modest program, easy to do, doesn't cost much money, and the payoff is huge. Let me just, um, have a, on your point real quick, um, we do run summer camps here in the police department through Camp Brown. We, the positive programming for prevention, especially in the summertime, is critical. We take about 7,000 kids into police department programs every year, but we couldn't do it. I know my boss is not here today, but he was here the other day, but without the mayor's commitment to having all the other agencies support us, which uh, Mayor Gray has been wonderful at, um, Department of Parks and Recreation and all the social service agencies, um, he, he has them support us. So I don't have, I mean, my cops work the summer camps and the summer programs, but a lot of that stuff he has the other agencies pitch in and help, which is a, a tremendous support mechanism for the families also. Mayor Landra? Yeah, if, if I might, and I thank, I thank the mayor from Baltimore for talking about um, seizing other uh, cities initiatives which we have aggressively done and I, and I took to heart what Chief Lanier said about not one size fits all and we have really tried to to borrow from best practices I know that um that Boston and, and now Baltimore but Chicago also was working on what they call ceasefire we've now expanded mm -hmm. that into three cities we're just beginning to do that and we, we're hoping to see based on what other folks tell us some meaningful results but Patrick I didn't I didn't want to be remiss and not mentioning Andy Casey Foundation. When I, before I became mayor, I had the pleasure of being the Lieutenant Governor of the state, and we worked with Andy Casey on juvenile justice reform. Just a, an unbelievable partner in trying to get that system right. So I think the chief made a really good point. You want to aggressive policing, but you want to arrest the right people mm -hmm. and not the wrong people. And you want to have the capacity in your jails for the right people, not the wrong people. And in Louisiana, our juvenile justice system was upside down. And so what we, we, we were doing was actually putting the wrong kids in jail and them training them how to be better criminals uh, and not having the kind of services that we needed. And we continue to work on that in Louisiana. Unfortunately, uh, New Orleans at the time did not really opt into the city, into that reform. And so we're continuing uh, to implement what we did on the statewide level. But you guys have really been fantastic in that. And I thank you for your support. And as Stephanie said, it does require public resources, not for profit, you know, federal, state, and local. Uh, and then again, cross-agency cooperation because it's not just a policing issue. Right. And, uh, and I know a lot of the police officers say it just can't be us, and they're correct. They got to do their job, but it's got to be everybody as well. I think I saw Mayor Kwan. Uh, can we get our microphone over here? I just wanted to thank Los Angeles, and I had sent a crew down after. I don't know how many of you went this summer and went to Antonio's old neighborhood in Boyle Heights. and. Um, um, I was a little skeptical. I said, well, well this is like a show because there were so many people in the park, right? And I actually sort of lived out that way uh, for a short time. And um, we went back and replicated in Oakland in a tough neighborhood in, in a park that had been taken over by a gang. And I didn't have the kind of money or the infrastructure. I wanted to try it right away. And so we picked six Fridays. And we basically got hot dogs donated and got... We just started having turf dance contests and DJs and... Pretty soon, by the end of summer, we had 200 parents hanging out there, and that was the beauty of this. Parents out there, in this case, black and Latino parents who had not been talking to each other in a park that no one was using because they were afraid of being there. And by the end of summer, the crime in that neighborhood, I'm just thinking, six Fridays, nothing fancy, none of the staffing that he has. He hires teenagers to organize it, which would have been better, and I'm looking to do that next year. Um, he had health groups come in and do nutrition displays, and they had all of these activities, and it made the parks feel safe. And it didn't cost a lot of money. And we're not obviously being here. We're all gotten the message from the Hill. We're not getting a lot of money, but I actually urge people to try it. I didn't have a lot of money. We only did it six Fridays. The crime in that neighborhood went down 50% by the end of summer uh, because the parents got to know each other, right? And the kids began to feel safe. And we basically chased the gangs out of the park and didn't cost a lot of money. So I think these things, I stole from L.A. as quickly as I could. And um, the one question I do have is that you do have an amazing program. You hire the kids, you get the food donated, and you got a lot of it from the private sector. Could you tell us just a little bit more how you got the donations to get your program going? Well, you know, part of that is also related to an infrastructure that's been created in our city. We actually have a deputy mayor of strategic partnerships whose entire function of that office is to create private-public partnerships. Our summer night lights program, the one that your staff came to visit and you came to visit with the mayors, 
We do not have a public line item budget for it, meaning that we raise roughly between 2.5 and $3.5 million per year to do that program. Now, when your staff came to visit, um, we in fact went to some parks that were very successful, but we also went to some parks that we were having real difficulties with. And what was impressive to me, we actually spent about 14 hours with your staff, um, is that they understood the very basic concept of what it takes to reduce violence through this approach. It really isn't about the hot dogs or some of the other fancy activities. It really is about community engagement. So I maintain that in these neighborhoods, communities will choose this type of program over body bags all the time. These are not communities that really would like to have violence in that community. So whatever resources we can bring in, the program can be done one day a week, three days a week, or full-blown how we do it. But, and for us, it was, you know, we learned a lot by spending time with your staff. You know, I think that's a terrific quote on which to end, that a community will choose this kind of engagement over body bags any time. Please join me in thanking the panel for the stimulating discussion. All right, yeah, no, just call me. Sure. Yeah, sure.